I just hit record. I could give you permission, but I don't know how, so I'll just send it to you. All right, sweet. Finally, excellent. Finally. We All did right. it. So, ex- <laughs> God bless Zoom. <laughs> Let me close all my other tabs, close everything else. I recorded like a half an hour video recently and then only after recording did I find that like um, the mic was clipping weirdly and turns out it was the CPU. Like I had my Chrome open and stuff. Uh, It's embarrassing. Yeah, I I actually did um, my podcast. I did a podcast for a while and I was streaming it and uh, my audio was bad for like 20 episodes. So (laughs) (laughs) yikes. Wow. It It had like a weird whistling sound, like coming from the, the, um, just from the speakers. It was really bad. Yeah. I guess when you see the big picture in the long run, it doesn't really matter as long as you're getting better, but it is, it is kind of sad on retrospect when you realize that, Oh shit. It was very sad. It's very sad in <laughs> retrospect because some, some of the conversations were really good. But I know no one will ever watch them because the audio quality is trash. Yeah, unfortunate. Anyway, let's catch people up on what we were talking about. So we were talking about communities yeah. and how, how, you know, how difficult it is to grow a community well. Yeah. Yeah, you, you kind of have to grow slowly. If you grow fast, uh, you usually got big problems. Right. The, the, the one thing that you said that I that I really wanted to. You have a cat. Yeah. Oh. Yes. The one thing that I said. Yeah. The one thing that you said that I really wanted to talk about uh, was you're talking about institutions, and it's not a company necessarily. It's just like a scene. Right. And exactly. I, yes. I was talking to my wife about this recently, and I was mm-hmm. shocked by how little language we have to talk about an a human organization that is not a company. Right. There's this great. We have like no mm-hmm. way to talk mm-hmm. about a group of people being productive towards some end that is right. not a company. <laughs> right. There have been people, people are confused by it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There have been people who've been thinking about this sort of thing like for a long time, but they don't really have like mainstream attention. So one of my, you know, I read an es- a book of essays by a biology watcher. So his name is Lewis Thomas. Uh-huh. He's kind of like a he's kind of like a Carl Sagan kind of character, but didn't get as big. Cool. You know, he was like in the in the seventies. I'm a big Sagan and he's, fan. Sagan is awesome. I yeah. I want to. I hope I hope that someday I can do something in the spirit of what Sagan oh. was doing. Right, just that kind of you know getting people excited Absolutely. about. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. So Lewis Thomas was kind of Sagan esque, and um, he was a biology watcher, and so he had these really beautiful essays about language and about um, organisms and 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 uh, ecosystems and stuff like that. And you know, he I, I loved how he didn't just talk about his science; he would also use the lenses that he got from observing science to talk about music and, mm-hmm. and, com- and communities. And so he talked about, um, I think there's this institution called the Marine Biology Lab or something like that, MBL. And he writes an essay kind of saying, let's, let's examine the MBL as if it were an organism. And he points out that, okay, there's, there's like funding, there are scientists, there are students. And then he points out how like, you know, so the, but the MBL is not any one thing. It's not the building. It's not the people alone. It's, it's like a, it's a pattern in space time that people participate in. And it almost yeah. has its own, it has its own mind in a way. And, and he, he speaks about it with this reverence and you're kind of like, oh, that, that would be cool to be a part of. And he describes how like, you know, there's like a beach next to the place. And then like people would go to the beach on like nice days and you'd see people um, like drawing equations in the sand to explain stuff to each other. And it's just like, oh, wow, that's so, that's you know, it's, cool. it's, an ins- yeah, it's an institution. I think it's still around. And it's just this, this tradition and this, this way of being. And I think very often when people talk about certain things, like they might say, oh, you know, like a, a certain university or a certain, you know, some people talk about the Bay Area or just some, some scene or some whatever. It's really not the place but it's the it's the whole thing. It's everything about how it's working out. There's also this great story about um, I think the uh, I I might be getting this wrong, but I think it was like the Shah of Iran, maybe like again in the seventies or something, who wanted to buy a factory 
for mm. like to, to to produce like weapons and to produce manufacturing and he kind of and it never worked out because like i mean for a bunch of reasons like um the the construction costs were overwhelming and like but the the point that the author made was that even if it did work out and he built his amazing factory it wouldn't have achieved what he wanted it to because he was hoping to buy technology or like buy you know like like buy his 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 country or whatever into the future but yeah. like it's not the factory itself it's the universities and the people and the culture and and just like millions of things all coming together and playing around whereas if you take any one factory somewhere in that's part of an ecosystem and you blow the factory up like in a few months or whatever people will find new ways to make it alive again yeah yeah and and yeah so the challenge is really getting people to even appreciate that about how anything works it's like it's millions of things yeah yeah i was thinking about that on my car ride recently i just dropped my son off at daycare i was thinking about how i like to look at the connections between two things and i don't necessarily look at any of the things in themselves mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it is it's very strange to explain that <laughs> yeah it's like what are you talking yeah. about well it's like well i'm I'm talking about a scene. I'm talking about this thing that we all do together. And it's like, well, but show right. me that thing. And it's like, you kind of can't. Right. Yeah. The it's kind of happening on... Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's happening on, on Twitter as well. Like, you can... like So everybody's yeah. kind of doing their own thing, but they're kind of doing it in the presence of everybody else. And you'll yeah. see, like, ideas get passed on from person to person. And it's yeah. not always passed on perfectly. It's like they might put their own spin on it. And seeing other people around you kind of doing similar-ish things, it just motivates you to be more ambitious and to, to try more things and stuff mm. like that. Uh, the one I thing I don't like about Twitter is that I, do, I don't, I can't see like people's affiliation or there isn't, there's too uh, little true. of a home. You know what I mean? That's like true. with the NBL, yeah. there probably was, right. was at least one place where it, it exists beyond that, but there's kind of some hub. There's some That's true. identifier. Yeah. There's some Mecca. There's some temple, whatever you want to call it's, it. That's a good but on point. Twitter, yeah, I, I feel like I don't know. I can tell that there's little there's groups, but mm -hmm. I don't really know. If there's yeah, <laughs> I think I think that's that's true, and it's healthy f that we have like a diversity of options. Like, no one thing should be everything for everyone. Like, you should have a, a physical place that you can go to. You should have some friends you know, that you don't talk to every day, but they're like doing different things from elsewhere and like have, so that you, you're not kind of too dependent on any one thing. Like, so even if, if it's like, you know, if, if I was only entirely dependent on Twitter for my, my socializing and, and all my psychological needs, and then like, let's say I got my account like hacked or deleted, like, wow, that's, that's, problem. that's yeah. So you have to have, you know, your own blog ideas. I, I'm a huge advocate that everyone should have their own blog, even if, mm -hmm. even if you're not like a blogger and you're not posting regularly or whatever. It's just nice to have a, a space that's your name and your face and kind of your, uh, your affiliations, like you said, right? It's like um, what things you care about. People can mm -hmm. find you, they can leave comments, they can email you, whatever. And it's just nice. I agree. I wish that yeah. Facebook had done that long ago. I don't know what Facebook is anymore. I don't yeah. know what, what it's useful for. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, you know, I, so I, I'm guessing you're like me in that you were online kind of before the kind of, um, metropol metropolis sization of the internet. Like it used to be this, this quiet nerd corner that people yeah. went to, to get, to get away from the world. And it's like, there's, you know, there's no, there's some ads here and there maybe, but it's like, nobody goes online back then to make money because there wasn't money in it. So it's all just there's a bunch no of money to be made. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so there, there was nerd drama for sure, but it wasn't, you know, no one was like grifting at the time. Mm -mm. Maybe there were some pioneers, but like it was just, the, the whole vibe was different. It was a very, um, like a, like a unknown bar on the edge of town that's like not very famous, but like for some reason there's great music and like you go there and you meet other people there and it's cool. Yeah. And now it's like, it's become developed and, and gentrified and like there's this mega core bustling giant skyscrapers of Facebook and YouTube and uh, it's it's not all bad. There's good stuff that comes out of it, but it's kind of unfortunate that um, in the quest for, I don't know, more ad revenue and fast growth and getting rich and whatnot, like people have lost that. I mean, so it's still the it's still there if you go looking for it, but it's such a shame that that spirit was not, we weren't able to keep that spirit kind of at the core of everything. 
I agree. But I'm still optimistic. I'm still optimistic because I think we can still find. So you know, even though YouTube is like the vast majority of YouTube is you know kind of um, these very algorithm optimized content that's like super. This person reacts to that, or you know, all these kind of very slapstick, crazy content. Uh, I have been posting on my YouTube account just kind of ad lib videos of me talking about stuff and like the comments I've been getting. So I have like 650 subscribers now or 640 something. And you know, it's small, but like I get maybe five to 10 comments on some of my videos and it's mm-hmm. super thoughtful and nice. And it just, it, it feels good. It reminds me of like the older days of, you know, you have a guest book on your blog and someone yeah. writes like this long thoughtful comment, which is great. Like you feel, you feel a sense of connectedness. Which is, yeah, it's, it's one of the grand ironies of our time that, I mean, it's, it's, it's become such a cliche that when you say it, people are like, oh my God, stop talking. Like, stop saying that stupid cliche. But I it's like true. It. It's true. Say it. It's true that we are, we are more connected than ever and but, yet we are lonely. And yet, yeah. no, it's true. I think yeah. about that all the time. How yeah. is that possible? Right? I think yeah, that it's, it's good it's that, because... um, I think that it's good that, uh, I think a lot about incentives and how companies mm-hmm. like YouTube, for example, they want to drive clicks and drive consumption. Right. Like you as a creator right. don't necessarily, you, you have a sense of high quality consumption or low quality consumption. In other words, you don't want to yes. bunch of people like, you don't want a ton more views if it means your comment section turns to trash and you're not actually talking. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's I think that dehumanizing. It's really yeah. It is. Yeah. It is. Yeah. I like the so, idea it's a lot that the people who are watching and commenting on your videos, they came to see you and to hear your thoughts. And when they comment, you know, it's because they really wanted to. It's not for any like, you know, economy or whatever. It's not for karma. Yeah. It's just to, right. you know, say yeah. things back because they got some value yeah. out of what you were talking about. Yeah. And I reply and I enjoy replying. You know, even with, with email, I think people, there's this, there's this riff or this, this sense. People say that, oh, once upon a time, like you would look forward to your email. And, I mean, when you get letters in the mail, you're like, ah, bill, bill, add, bill. And then when you get an email, it's like, oh, wow, somebody sent me an email. And then now it's like, nobody ever sends you letters. So when you get a letter, you're like, oh shit, somebody wrote me a letter. And then you check your email, it's like, add, <laughs> add. You know? But like, yeah, I, I think it's possible still to kind of, it's, it's, it's almost like when I talk to people in general, I feel like a lot of people having had a few bad experiences or having had a sense of the, like, again, like the, the worst things that happen on the internet get the most attention. And so people feel like, oh no, like there's no more, there are no more kind, friendly nerds on the internet, which is not mm-hmm. true. Like th- no. those people are still, they're still everywhere, but they're disconnected and they are, they, they, their voices are not loud. So you have to kind of deliberately set up filters to, look past the, the lurid, crazy, angry mm. stuff and mm-hmm. find other people who are patient and kind. And I, I you know, I've been, I've been second guessing myself about this a little bit because I, I bang this drum so much, like be kind, be friendly, make friends, like we're out there, which is true. But like what I, I feel like um, I don't say as much because I don't want to discourage people too early is that it is a painful process because you will be disappointed a lot and you will get you know, like initially people, initially the pain is that nobody responds at all. And then you're like, why am I doing this? Why am I being so patient and kind when like nobody seems to care? And then when people start to care, then you get rewarded for that, which is amazing. But then you get, that gives you a little bit of notoriety and attention. Like when you get to like 10,000, 20,000 followers, now people see you as a little bit of a small target. It's not the same as when you're like a, you know, a million follower accounts where you are, you're basically designated as a public space, right? Yeah. But yeah. even so, when pe- people see you with 20,000 followers and they see an opportunity to kind of, you know, kind of, if they reply something snarky or mean or whatever, and then your followers feel res- obliged to defend you, then they get free engagement from being mean to you. And then you ha- like, you know, it becomes that whole mess, which is, which is a pain to deal with. And, uh, you know, I guess human psychology is that you get used to the good stuff and you take it for granted, but every new bad thing that happens just pisses you off. So you have to, re- if you want to do what I am doing or, you know what, if you want to do this kind of like pro-social community work on the internet, you really have to manage your, your psychology in a very rigorous way. It's yeah. almost like, 
it's almost like being a performance athlete in a way. Like you have to take care of your 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 nutrition and your health and your like your mental health has to. You're like a you become like a. That's an interesting way of framing it. I don't think I framed it explicitly like this before, which is to become an internet. And I'm guessing this is true even off the internet, but like on the internet, it's so immediate that it's even more necessary to become like an internet um, community manager. You have to you have to manage your mental health in a way that is akin to an athlete managing their health. Like you really yeah. have to endure terrible shit and be, you know, yeah, somehow manage to maintain your sanity. Yeah. Because if your brand is about positivity and nurturing positivity, like mm-hmm. that is your greatest asset. And if others can just come into your garden, like into your asset and just like mess it all up, you've got no positivity left. Right. What can you do? Yeah. Yeah. I think about and that then, a lot when it comes to melee for me, like where do I get, mm-hmm. I have this sense of uh, this deep passion and this kind of uh, sense of acceptance of anybody who cares about the game. And it doesn't really, I don't know where it comes from, but it's like very, very deep. And I feel like no one could ever put it out. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I don't know how I got this way, but it's definitely there. Right. Um, give, give me like a, give me like a, like a two minute kind of quick, um, bio of how, of your melee journey like how did it start and how do you get to where you are what's the so lonely lonely nerd right that's how <laughs> it starts i was in college right. and i was completely directionless uh uh-huh. and i met some gamers who were playing melee and they played have you ever watched the matrix yeah yeah of you, course. you remember it's like you know talking about the agents or whatever like neo it's like you yeah. move like they do it's like there's just this sense of you can move <laughs> so fast and you can be so strong i played this mm-hmm. game for years i walked into that you know basement <laughs> and people were moving 10 times faster than I ever did and it hit harder a hundred times, a hundred times harder. And I right. just, I just felt inspired. It was a sense of like, Oh, I want to learn how to do that. Like it looks doable. Mm-hmm. Human beings are doing it. I'm going to learn how to do that. Nice. Uh, so I pretty much like pivoted my life around the game because it, that sense of inspiration, it was so, so awesome. Uh, and wow. I just like, kept grinding and I met new people and it's interesting when you're in a community there's levels of people. So, you know, you mm-hmm. start at the bottom and you can find someone who's just about as good as you or a little bit better and you can right. learn from them. And then, you know, you learn their stuff and then you go a little bit deeper. So I, you keep meeting different people and there's a sense of progression. Nice. Um, so I kept doing that for many years. Uh, I be, actually became like a content creator off the back of it. It's almost like there was this creative energy deep inside that didn't get expressed. Mm-hmm. And once right. I had a purpose or a reason, you know, I was organizing tournaments and bringing people together. Um, nice. you know, I was making kind of, I was a moderator in my little corner of my little forum. Uh, right. you know, I made like little guides. Uh, I made some combo videos, which are kind of, mm-hmm. it's like video production and, you know, audio and stuff right. like that and recording. Right. So you just learn a bunch of skills because right. you care about something. The yes. craziest is, uh, when super, the next version, Super Smash Brothers Brawl came out, I actually had to buy a soldering iron and like solder a chip onto a Wii to hack it to be able to, you know, play the game a little bit earlier. So it's like you learn all kinds of crazy stuff when you care about something. Wow. Uh, But yeah, super fast forward to 2013 or so. um, I stopped playing more or less and it was kind of, uh, I was looking for my place in the scene where I was kind of like an elder. I wasn't a player Mm -hmm. anymore. I didn't have the time to stay good. Um, Right. And I noticed that in this other community, StarCraft II, they were like the, the, the biggest eSport at the time. They had podcasts yes. and they had, they had a bunch of technology and they had production and they had content that we didn't have. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking nice. to myself, well, you know, if I enjoy listening to a talk show about StarCraft, I bet Melee Heads would enjoy a podcast about Melee. So yeah. I started doing that um, and it started very badly, but it got better <laughs> every time. I mean, really, consistency right. is, is so dope. Yes. Yeah. And I remember in 2013, there was a donation drive with the, the biggest fighting game tournament around. It's called Evo, where they had yeah, seven games on their grand stage and they were going to mm-hmm. allow one like old game or whatever, like a not known game to have the eighth spot. It was a, right. a competitive community-based fundraiser for raising money right. for breast cancer research. And oh, it nice. was Melee and a couple other fighting games. Um, and long story short, uh, my podcast was kind of the the you know the home of of the fundraising effort for melee and it was the sickest experience in my life wow so like wow. midnight of the night i truly felt like i truly truly felt like i was connected in a physical sense to every single person who ever cared about this video game 
um, wow. as we all came together, kind of to breathe new life into a, a scene that was kind of dying. You know, it just almost had that sense <laughs> of the fire going out and like it's our responsibility to keep it going. That's um, amazing. And we did keep it going. I just got back from a tournament la last weekend where we probably had, you know, tens of thousands of viewers. Um, the second uh, biggest prize pool in the game's history. It was like seventy thousand dollars. Wow! So we're still this alive is, this, and kicking twenty years later. Right. This is super nourishing for me to hear, because um, you know. So when I was a child, my things were you know there's books and there was video games and. I never, so video games was always important to me, but I never really kind of went all the way. I was always kind of like on the fringes. So I would play, you know, Counter-Strike, Dota, um, like obscure RPGs and stuff. Yeah. I remember I used to write, some of the first few things I wrote that were pretty substantial was I used to write FAQs for Street Fighter, like, like weird Street Fighter games. And, awesome. you know, I'd, particip I'd participate on game FAQs forums. I would argue with i actually so a lot of my a lot of my game epic users legit man i was scared of that yeah. place those guys were yeah. serious Bru yeah so i was i on retrospect i i got a lot of my like internet discourse skills from arguing with people on forums because yeah like, those those people didn't you know you like the only way to really persuade those people is to be right like you have to be you have to have the better arguments and and whatnot and like, yeah, I've, it's funny for me to encounter people from elsewhere who don't have that background and they kind of, I mean, that's, a, that's a separate story, yeah, but it's, 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 it's just the point being that those people, like I've, I felt connected to them, even the people I was arguing with, like you know, and disagreeing with, like we're all, but we care about the same things. Yeah. And, you know, I was always getting messaging from my family and my broader community in Singapore at the time was like, just, you know, games are frivolous, not important you know, um, don't waste your time playing games. It's changed here as well now. Like, we do have esports teams and there's, um, you know, it's, it's gaming is now pretty... It's, it's interesting, like, just trying to un answer the question of is gaming as respected as, um, like, you know, movies and so on? Where I'm from, I think people are still coming to terms with it. Like, they, they can no longer deny that it's something. Like, they're, they're, yeah. they're, still, they're still slow to fully accept it or, or kind of see it for what it is. But they can't deny that, oh, you know, like, this guy's friend just paid off his family home with his winnings or whatever. Like, once that yeah. happens, like, even the, even the very conservative Asian parents are like, oh, what's going on? <laughs> you know? But right. it's not, but, the, but I think what we know is that it's not about the money, right? The money is just... It's a, it's a, it's a symptom in a way, right? It's a, it's a, it's a residual outcome of the fact that there are millions of people who care and are connected to each other through this thing. Yeah. And that was, that was what I really wanted when I was playing video games and talking to people about video games. And yeah. Just this sense of community. You know, some, some of the things that, that really mess me up emotionally is reading like those like missed connection stories about video games. Like some guy oh, was oh playing. God playing Xbox, playing Halo with a friend for like years and then his friend got cancer or something. Like, oh, that, that shit really just, it crushes me. Yeah. It's so beautiful because it and is sad. it's a real human connection, right? And when you lose it, it's yeah. a real thing that's lost. It's not some bullshit. It's not... Yeah. yeah. It's someone yeah. who spent time with you. It's someone... And they don't even know who you are. So that's like, you know, like the assumptions that we make about humanity, right? It's like, oh, my, my brother and I used to play catch. Like, yeah, he's your... And, and he's your brother. I mean, it's beautiful. And he's your brother. Like, you know, it's understandable why you have... But here, like, you know, all you know is that that guy's strange username and some bunch of squiggles that you don't understand. And like, just through shared experience in this digital space, it's almost more pure in a way, right? And yeah. I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that having had that kind of experiences with anonymous stranger friends, it like, it gives me hope in humanity in a way, yes, right? Me too. And that, no, and I yeah. think, I think that there's a lot to be hopeful about. I really do. Like when people come to, here's what I believe nowadays. It's like when people come together and they do have that kind of shared purpose. So they have one thing that they agree that they care about. Mm hmm Strangers get along, man. People help each yeah. other out. I, I, yes. If when people feel connected to each other, this is the th another thing that I think is going to change. It's going to be like the, the thing that's going to change in the 2020s or whatever is that mm -hmm. with a sense of real connection comes money. Like people nowadays right. not have that. And it, it is very obvious to me that uh, mm -hmm. 
if the connection's there and there's a good reason yeah. to spend money, then people will spend the money. Patreon's showing yeah. that and Twitch is showing that. I mean, my job for like five years was about mm -hmm. monetization of, you know, community. Mm -hmm. And right. uh, the money is totally there and it feels really right. good to spend. You know, one of my tenets, right. one of my principles as I did that job is that, you know, I didn't want anyone to spend a dollar and regret it on Twitch. Right, right. Beautiful. And I That's find that beautiful. they really don't, you know, you spend yeah. $5 a month and you don't, you don't necessarily get much as a subscriber on Twitch, but I find that people feel good about having spent it. You know, they feel like they're supporting something that's worth it. Right. I think, I think there are parallels with like, um, with church communities, for example, so for a lot of people, yeah. for a lot of people, it's like they go, it, I mean, so even, even without discussing religion itself, it's just, there is this space in this community that people all go to together once a week or something. And they make, they make friends with people and they care about similar things and they feel that they have something in common. And so then it just becomes obvious that, you know, if anybody needs help, like somebody's got an accident or somebody's, you know, whatever, like everyone just comes together to help that person. It's just, it's just the obvious thing to do. You don't even need to calculate or think about it or, you know, it's like, it's a natural human instinct. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, so even with my approach to interneting in general has been something like, I never really set out to make money. Like money has just never been a, a priority for me. Like, you know, like, um, yeah, I, I've made, I've consistently made decisions in my life where, you know, choosing between the path that gives me more money and the path that I think is more interesting. I pick the path that I think is more interesting. Hell and yeah. I don't, I don't feel like I'm making a, a sacrifice doing that. Some people do. I, and I have friends who are like, you know, in their mid thirties and they're like, they, they picked the other path. They picked being a lawyer or investment banker. And how whatever. are they doing? And, and yeah, they are pretty miserable, man. They're like disconnected. They don't know what they care about. They, their friends from work are all like. Oh, I love it! I love like it! That. You, I love that you said they don't know what they care about because they had to. They answered a question about what do you care right. about, right? What are you going to prioritize money? Or are you going to prioritize what's interesting to you? And they chose money, right? But right. people don't really care about money once you have it. Like once you have it, yeah. Right. Yeah. What's more of it going to do? I think we know that really well. So it's kind of yeah. like if you ask yourself the question, what do I care about? Your past mm -hmm. tells you that you care about money, but your felt sense tells you right. you don't. So what do I care yeah. about? And it's a tough question yeah. to answer once you've, you know, gone down that path, you know, that for you right. that fork in the road. Yeah. So figuring out what right, figuring out what you care about is like the most important thing. It's like it's, you know, if you I can't even put it in financial terms because it varies depending on your circumstances, but I think at the end of a lifetime, assuming you've had kind of a, you know, like upper, like middle class internet savvy person, let's just say you probably make maybe a million ish dollars in your life, two million ish, you know, like the, your bad. I'm not a money guy, but just roughly in that sphere, I would say knowing what you care about, like in your 20s, at the end of your life, that's worth multiple million dollars, I think, you know, kind of like just, just in terms of, I mean, I'm not literally going to connecting, counting the beans, I know, but just I know the what sense you're saying. of. Right. I would rather I forgo, I would forgo the pile of cash. And again, it's like, you know, some people say, oh, I need the money to pay for my bills and pay for my, you know, sorry, pay for like emergencies and insurance and stuff. And I've always felt like, um, you know, part of the reason I'm so obsessive about building relationships with other people is that I need people. I mean, and okay, I can, I, we can have a separate conversation about whether being too needy about this is a bit of a dysfunction. Like, you know, there's, there's like the dark side to it. Like there's wanting a dark side people that, yeah. to care about you. Mm -hmm. But like, if you can be healthy about it, like having human connections with other people, it's actually the real, it's real wealth. And like, you know, it's connections to jobs, it's connections to like any meaningful thing that you're going to get in life is usually through somebody else. Or it's through a bureaucratic process and processes don't give a shit about you. Right. So the best way, yeah. So the best way to, you know, like improve your, your earning potential is to make lots of friends with, who could potentially refer you to a great job. And the best opportunities like don't go on the market because they get snapped up by friends and stuff. And, you know, I was watching this other video, not this, like there was like a, I was scrolling through Twitter and there was this, um, something like UN, HCR, I can't remember, like some United Nations ad. And uh, it was about a, a lady who was a refugee. And, you know, it's kind of a sad story, but like, so she was talking about how I think she left, um, it might have been Yemen, but I'm not sure where exactly. And she was saying, you know, back home, I was, you know, like, like people focus on like, uh, like the money, like, oh, refugees are poor. But her point was that back home, she had, every, she had everything. She had an identity, she had friends, she had prestige, she had 
you know, a sense of place, a sense of like all of those things that make people feel human and alive. Mm -hmm. And like, you know, when she became a refugee, she lost all of that. And it's not just, um, so some people think, oh, if you just give refugees money, they'll be fine. But it's not because when they're in a new community, like they don't know who to talk to. They don't, their social standing in the community, even if they had money, it's just not there. And they feel kind of frightened and disconnected. And I've always, and you know, that clarified something for me. It made me realize that, again, what I do in a way is, and you could call this kind of like slightly um, a bit uh, paranoid prep prepper kind of mindset but uh, I, I think I approach it in a healthy-ish way but like if I ever had to you know abandon my life and go somewhere else like I I have the insane privilege of knowing I could go to the States I could go to Europe I, I, I could, there are many places in the world I could go and there are like dozens of people who will be like hey come right here let me help you set up you can crash my place you can I want I to I I stop you right there because number one I agree and I have that same privilege Number two, don't you think it's fucked up that we think that that's an insane privilege? Like, isn't it yeah. kind of messed up that, like, there's all these people in the world? And I believe that, like, everyone, you know, Should. if I got to know people, I'm sure that, like, mm -hmm. pretty much everyone's super cool. Right. But, like, that they don't feel like they have anywhere to go if they had to abandon yeah. their life. That no one's going to, yeah. like, take care of them. No one, like, knows right. them. Yeah. When I think about... When I think about what's wrong with the world, I always talk about belonging. I always talk about identity. Yeah. I always talk about yeah. this stuff because I feel that like yeah. humans have a sense of, is there anyone out there who will take care of me if things get bad? And when the right. answer is yeah. no, we freak out and we start looking yeah. for it, but we don't yeah. know how to find it. Yes. yes. I think about yes. this yes. all the time. Same. I, Same. Think that, I think that like society is like, you know, mm -hmm. the individuals in society, now we're not talking about the whole thing. We're talking about at the unit level. That we've right. got people who are stressed and like right. not super happy and feel insecure. Yeah. And it's because right. we haven't built a world where you can feel the way that you feel where, you know, okay, yeah. if shit goes real bad. I can right. go someplace else. Somebody's going to have my back. I think about yeah. that too. Like yeah. if government, Same. anything happened to my wife and kid, You're right. you know, I could go to my parents' house and they would take care of me, of course. But like, I didn't, I don't super belong. You know what I mean? I Fair could enough, go yeah. with my melee homies and they would take care of me. If there are people right. who take care of me. Yeah. As, so you know, not yeah. as you know, I wouldn't have to be somebody else. And for example, you know, I wouldn't have to go to Rome and do what the Romans do. I could still be me, and right. someone would you know hold me a, a, as me. That yeah. Feels really and, you know, good. and I think that you know when kids feel compelled to seek influence, like when kids say they want to be a YouTuber or a TikTok mm -hmm. influencer or fame, Instagram mm -hmm. party or whatever, like at the core of the motivation is, is some version of that like yeah there's also the trappings of wealth and blah 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 but like at the core of it is you know like belonging like and in a sense of people and the, the sad thing is that when you're young and you don't know what you're doing and you don't have a strong sense of self yet you might compromise to get what you think that is and so you know you start posting <coughs> you start posting like bad <coughs> choking on drinks yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, ha it happens ah you might start, you know, posting weird, controversial shit. And then you get a lot of traffic and you think that that traffic means people care about you, but they don't. They just... And so it's challenging to... Yeah, the incentives, so like, you know, the incentives are... The, the, oh my God, isn't it <laughs> nuts that uh, even as a content creator, it's the same as companies where at, all the time you have a choice as a company of I could get more money in the short term. It kind of means... Yeah selling out my customers and giving them a shit option that's going to, it hurts right. in the long run, but it'll give you a short-term boost. Yeah. And same with as a content creator, right? You can, you can post some bullshit that's going to attract a lot of people, but it does mm -hmm. something to your brand and it does something yeah. to your community. It changes how right. people think about who you are. Yeah. And, and the best people will leave, which is not obvious. So let's say you have a thousand it's followers. And you're like, it's not obvious. Yeah. yeah. You have a thousand really followers. Were gonna up to you for who you were right the people who yeah. really liked you when you were being you and you weren't going in that direction like those are yeah. the people who are going to be driven away yeah so i i study celebrities very closely i just partially out of pure intellectual curiosity partially out of you know a little bit of a cautionary tale kind of thing and you can see how it happens like um you know ah uh, it's a uh, it's a long and winding but yeah you know i feel like this is something that again 
at a societal level, we should be discussing this openly and talking about it and like talking about the trade-offs. Agreed. And, you know, so like if my nephews, for example, they're still a bit too young to really get into it. But if they wanted to become famous, I wouldn't be like, oh, that's bad. You shouldn't do that. Or, oh, that's great. You should definitely do that. I'd be like, okay, let's, let's have a conversation about what your motivations are. Like if you think you just want to have a lot of viewers, that's, that's, I understand. But like, let's talk about it. Let's think about what the outcomes will be for you down the road. Like what kind of expectations will they have of you? How will they turn on you depending on what you do? Like, like you have to just consider those things. And if you don't consider those things, the, the algorithm or the, the forces beyond your, the algorithm. like the, the external world. I mean, even before there was tech, like, you know, without your own personal values, there would always be this kind of, even if it's just other people, there is this societal algorithm that always nudges you towards what if we did, what if we try to make more money? You know, what if we put more ads? What if we, you know, and yeah, it's tough. It's, um, I, I think about this a lot, really. It's just, um, you know, even, yeah. So like, like last year, I went to San Francisco because some of my Twitter friends were hosting a dinner party and they wanted mm-hmm. me to come. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was apart from like my wedding day, you know, I kind of have to say that, right? But like, it was, it was, it was easily. You have like, to say it. The, I know. Right, I get yeah. in trouble for saying it's, this stuff too. Yeah, but I mean, my my, my wife knows. My, my my wife understands how I am and who I am and how this relates to who I am as a person. But I mean, yeah. So it's on par with the the best experience of my life, and mm-hmm. it's kind of it just you know. So like I they paid for my plane ticket, so I. I was on a plane from my country to that halfway good. across the planet because other nerds wanted to meet me and hear from me and stuff like that. And then when I was there, um, just the way people would DM me every day, offer to take me out to lunch. Uh, they, sometimes I would do things like I would meet one person for lunch and then somebody else would offer to walk me to my next appointment, which is like, what? <laughs> I, felt like, I felt like royalty. Yeah. I remember at some point, at some point, I was like, my phone charger is running out of battery. And I tweeted, does anyone have a phone charger? Someone and my friend was like, in. yeah, drop, yeah drop, drop by the office, AI office and, and, and like, you can use ours. And it just felt so, it felt so wholesome. I felt so loved and appreciated. And you know, the, 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 the wild thing is, again, if, if you've been in the Bay Area, they have like, there is a homelessness problem, for example. True. And you know, it's just the, 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 the disparity between I'm having this incredibly blessed experience and these poor people are, you know, they are struggling in, for their own re- I mean, so the, the understanding homelessness is, is a huge problem and it's like, you know, many, many factors and blah, blah, blah. But just kind of at the, at the most simplified level, like it, is, it, it, there's an, it feels like there's an injustice in a sense, like just that one human is having, everyone wants to help this guy and everyone's being nice and friendly to this guy. And then here's another guy who's, you know, down and out and like mm-hmm. um, people don't trust him. He doesn't trust people. And, you know, it, it's not like there's a simple quick fix that you can bestow upon this person and they are in the same place. But just considering that disparity makes me just think about how we should, I mean, it's, it's, it's really about, and again, it's not like, it's not like there's, uh, I applied for a, a grant or a scholarship or, or you know, like there's, there's one magic person looking out for me. It's really, it's like, because I have been so public and I have been like this a bit of an anomaly, like people have rallied around me and they trust me. And this feels like something that could be replicated and more people could learn how to do it. And as, you know, as more and more people do this kind of thing, we can kind of, I can visualize it kind of, you know, each person is like a a node in a graph or it's like a, it's like a branch in a tree and you have, you can expand this out into like a whole forest. And then once you have the whole forest, then you can also take care of people who might not be able to play the game as well. Yeah. But like this kind of adjacent and we can look out for each other more. So this happens in this, the thing that I'm obsessed. What you're talking about, I think like happens, like I could produce case studies about how it happens in the melee community and, you know, sort of there's the right. leaders and the leaders kind of, they start to, they play a different role over time where the first role is a galvanize that kind of, or incubate the, the initial community. But then beyond that, you kind of need to continue to grow it. And there's a trade-off that the leaders mm-hmm. have to, um, I'm hearing a blip. I don't know if that's coming from me, but. Uh, I don't hear anything. Cool. Good. Um, there's a trade-off <laughs> around uh, 
the integrity of the community and like the reason why it was built plus and the, and that with the accessibility and i think that the people mm -hmm. who are on the outside they tend to it's like if you're not sure this is my theory anyway if you're not sure that you belong say as a, as a melee player then you know maybe you suck at the game or whatever the natural right. ego instinct is to put other people down to kind of, you know, build yourself yeah. up. And so it, the people who are most on the outside are most likely to, let's say, uh, be like non-inclusive towards women, for example. Right. But the right. leaders who feel really secure in their position, they we know that the only way for the scene to thrive and survive is to be open and mm -hmm. accessible. Like anyone who cares about the game should be able to come in. So, right. you know, the kind of leaders become these nodes that are working on uh, making mm -hmm. the space safe for the people who yeah. are like, you know, have the least, yeah. let's call it status. Right. I, I feel like yeah. there's always two games being played, which is very unfortunate. It's very, very unfortunate. Mm -hmm. The first is whatever the community is about, you know, are you doing right. that thing? And then the second is this kind of social status game. I feel yeah. like as a social species, we cannot avoid playing the social status game. And the, the best communities are ones where that's clearly secondary. <laughs> um, right. But I've even found with players, uh, asking the question of whether I'm seen by others as a good enough human is like completely devastating to our ability to be productive. Like you can't take risks. Uh, oh, right. And, yeah. and you kind of, your motivations are just to be better than the next person. So competition does help build, but it doesn't help innovate and like get to new heights. Um, hmm. There's one player nowadays who's, I think, really getting very, very, very good. And he's like one of the only people who came in through, he's a doc documentary kid. There was a documentary that came out in 2013 and we had an influx hmm. of new players in 13. And he actually won a major tournament in January, 2020. So he climbed the ranks at that. That's astronomical as, as far as the pace goes. Right. And the thing that I sense is very different about him is that he doesn't have a question in his mind of whether or not he like belongs on a social right. level. When right. he loses, he takes the losses. Okay. When he wins, right, right. he doesn't really like, you know what I mean? Right. He's very excited yeah. about it, but you can tell that it doesn't, his, his, uh, his worth is not on the line when he plays the game. And that's like right. a superpower. So yeah. anyway, I'm just yeah. kind of saying that I feel like um, it's really clear that people's sense of belonging in the community is of mm -hmm. utmost importance. And the leaders yeah. end up kind of, you know, helping with that for people who right. are not necessarily playing the, the, the primary game well. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. You like have to That's make true. sure that everybody knows that like, okay, this person may suck in this way, but it doesn't mean that we can treat them like shit. Like you can't. Yeah. And you have to self-nominate to do that. That's one of the scariest things I'm noticing um, is that no one has given me the authority to do any of this, you know, or to care about any of this <laughs> or to, to yeah. police any of this. But, yeah. you know, because I have the trust of the majority of the community and I have credibility because I'm like a pretty good player. Um, right you know, I can pretty much do that. Yeah, it's a it's a persuasion game, I guess. I, I remember, um, so one of the men I admire a lot was uh, my secondary school principal. So in, in Singapore, every every able-bodied man has to serve in uh, the military. Or, I mean, you could also do the police or fire department. But um, so if you serve in the military, then you have like, um, once you're done with your two years of mandatory service. And then after that, you kind of have periodic, um, like you have to go back every couple of years or so for like a week or two weeks. And if you're like a senior officer, there's, there's more commitment. So my principal was, um, he was like a, like a reservist major or like, he's like, I don't know whether he kind of like volunteered for extra duties or he just, I, I don't know the specifics behind it, but mm -hmm. basically like, on top of his civilian life, he also is kind of in his spare time sort of being like the commanding officer of a whole freaking large group of men. And I was just curious to understand. So when I went back for like a school reunion thing, I asked him about like, you know, what's it like? What's it like to be, you know, the leader of so many men, like people yeah. from many different people from many different backgrounds and all that stuff. He said a bunch of stuff that I, I, I don't remember all of it, but some stuff stuck out for me. One was he said that he had to be at least as fit as half of them. So yeah. he, and he, I think, I think he's, he's like in the top 30% of yeah. physical fitness. Like, you know, nobody expects this older guy who's a commanding officer to be like the number one fittest guy in the military. Like he said, if I was the fittest guy in the military, I have failed in my, in my job because I need to 
persuade these younger guys to be fitter than me, right? But he can't be like the last bottom 10, bottom 20% because then no one will respect him. So he has to be in the top half and at least, and you know, the higher he goes, like up to like 20-ish percent, like he, yeah. he just gets more respect that way. And I've heard similar things from like my ex-boss about like uh, just, you know, being a software engineer and a CEO. It's like, again, like, you know, nobody expects the CEO to be the best engineer. But if you don't know what the fuck your, your guys are talking about, then like no one's going to respect you either. So there's that sense of, yeah. You have to be so there's two, that, that's enough. that now that you say it, it maps pretty well to the, you know, you're always playing two games, but the way that I put it in the past is you need two things, trust and credibility. Yeah. So when I think yeah. about what is signal, what is like signal versus noise, what's high quality information. Yeah. You trust the person yeah. and it's coming, you know, they have credibility. And at the end right. of the day, it's like trust, I think is that, you know, we sense trust if this person cares more about us than the money or whatever, right? Like they're, right. they're, do, yeah. they're provided, they think of what they're doing as giving, not as mm -hmm. a way to extract. And right. then credibility is just how much, you know, how, how close are you to, you know, some truth about whatever the thing that we right. care about is, you know, do you know right. what you're, I find that one harder to explain, but it seems to me like, melee for example or fitness for example or whatever you're whatever game you're playing there is mm -hmm. some truth that exists you know it's almost mm -hmm. like it's almost like i don't know you could call it the source or whatever there's some source truth of melee and right. we get the more experience you have and the more cases you know the more reflective you are the more right. you kind of get closer to filling in these gaps of knowledge or you, right. you, right. you do kind of learn deep truths about how the game works what it rewards Actually, this conversation is clarifying some things for me. So, like, me if you ask me kind of, um, what are you doing on Twitter, Visa? What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> like, what, what am I doing? I, I, I would say that there's, you know, so there's, again, like, the same way you have this trust and credibility thing or, like, the leader and soldier thing. I think, like, I, on Twitter, I'm known for, again, for being, like, a nerd. So, like, nerd posting and for being kind, which is, like, kind of, like, community norms managing kind of thing. And, I've actually, I think a couple of days ago, I actually found myself thinking, I feel weird because I haven't done any good nerd posting in a while. Like, it feels like I've been spending a, like a bit too much time kind of discussing community norms every, all the time. And then I start, I start to doubt myself even. Like, why am I, why am I, like, this, this isn't what I like came here to do, you know, like to tell people how to be like an occasional mention now and then like, Hey guys, you know, when this happens, we don't have to quote tweet and be mean or whatever. Like, like it's a periodic kind of like sermon sort of, right. It's, it's useful for people because it's not that you're telling them something they don't know, but you're like reminding people, <laughs> you're reminding everybody at the same time about what, what you think is right. And then everyone else can, can, you know, have a conversation about it or whatever. And that's helpful. Yes. But like, if you do that, if you make that like your permanent 100% role that you're doing all the time, I think it's very easy for people to get sick of you. And even I would get sick of myself. I get sick of myself if all day I'm telling other people how to live. Like, you know, like I, I should be, I should be doing my own nerd posting all the time. And then, you know, when people respond to it well, I celebrate that. When they respond to it poorly, I'm like, okay, we didn't have to do that. And because it's in relation to the nerd posting, people don't feel like I'm lecturing them on what right. kind of human being they are, right? It's, yeah. it's you know, so again, it's like, it's like I would say, I'm, I'm guessing in relation to your experience, it's like the game still comes first and being a decent person helps the game. Yes. Whereas like if you if if you haven't been playing the game, then you're just lecturing people and and like like patronizing them in a way. And if they can't see how, oh yeah, if I stop being a dick to people, like we can have more fun. Then it's just like, why is this guy telling me how to live? You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, to totally. As you say that, it reminds me of the way that I see that role is kind of. Sometimes I feel like I'm trying to stand out of the way and show people, you know, the game, because that's what yeah. we're all here to do. And I I've yeah. found it's very clear to me now that if I'm ever thinking about myself as a person, mm -hmm. you know, like I have some authority, mm -hmm. then I feel really weird. Like right. my authority comes from the game. And so I'm always referencing that, not what I think about it, just what it's yeah. told me sort of thing. It's a yeah. little different way to put it, but also, uh, you know, people can't receive that kind of criticism if they think that it's personal. And so yes, it's yes. not personal to say, Hey, like we don't quote tweet or whatever in this way, because, it doesn't help us do what we're already trying to do. In other words, I'm just yeah. trying to help you do yeah. the thing that you want to do better 
and yes. also it happens to help this other person, you know, yeah. uh, which is what helps everybody. It, it's right. cool because as the game grows, you know, we're talking about community and we're talking about um, sort of growing a space. Like the more people are involved, then the more eyeballs and the more money ultimately we yes. like yes. sustain more people doing yeah. the thing. But like, yeah. because we came first, we have more right. credibility than the new people. So like, they're right. going to be giving us money. Like yeah. if this all yeah. goes well, so like, please don't be mean to them. We kind of need them. Right. Yeah. 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 I, I definitely encountered versions of that in uh, my local music scene back in the day. And at th then I was younger and I didn't, I was, you know, more insecure, more kind of um, abrasive, eager to prove myself, eager to not lose in, in exchanges. And, uh, I think everybody, I'm, so I'm writing a whole novel about this. I was telling Toph about this. It's kind of a, you know, uh, let me kind Toph, of go my, through it. My, be, my best homie. Right, yeah. So my we were kind homie. of, uh, I was talking to him about, um, you know, so my experience with music was, you know, so I was a misfit, you know, I didn't get, I, people didn't relate to me, I didn't relate to them. And then I found that, oh, here's a scene of other misfits who also like music. And, you know, yeah. we all come together. And now we have like, we found family in each other. Yay. But, you know, that's like, that's like the first act one of the story. And then you realize that, oh, okay, like let's, we found friends. Let's all be rock stars together. Let's be great. Let's do amazing things. Sounds good. Turns out everybody has a slightly different vision of what being a rock star means and different ideas about what compromise means. And, you know, does it mean that we stop playing for fun? Must all practices be very serious? Is it that we can't be late for practice anymore? You know, is it that we can't just mess around? And, you know, there's all these compromises and, and conflict and we don't know how to manage that conflict in a way. And it feels like because we each projected our assumptions onto each other about what the dream is, now it feels like these people are betraying you much more intimately then anybody outside the scene could possibly hurt you. Like some random yeah. person who doesn't, who doesn't understand you, they can't really hurt you. They'd be like, oh, you freaking nerd. Like, yeah, I'm a nerd, whatever, right? But when two nerds have a disagreement and it's like about their values, then that feels way more, you know, personal and it feels way more, like, you know, whether it's about selling out or whatever it is. And navigating that conflict is such a challenge. And so in, in the novel that I'm writing, it's like this kid thinks that he wants to be a rock star. And so he kind of... Um, you know, he becomes like this angry, this, this, this very anxious taskmaster trying to push his friends saying, hey, let's be rock stars together. Let's, and then he kind of drives them away. And then like towards the end, he does actually become kind of a rock star with other bandmates. But he realizes that what he really wanted all along was, was family and belonging and whatnot. And like, yeah, so there's that conflict that he has to resolve. And um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's such a human story. And it's such a, you know, I feel like even hearing about your melee experience, it's such a, it's the kind of thing that I honestly feel like that's what novels are written about, you know, like war and peace and, and all those grand yeah. human narratives. It's really, it's all, it's this, it's belonging, it's conflict, it's, it's different ideas and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, you know I wanted to bring up something earlier. You mentioned um, extracting, you said like uh, people who, you know, approach something as the community versus extracting. So what's, yep. what's interest? what's interesting for me is, um, I have always been very, very averse to any kind of, of anything that even seems like extraction. And I've been forced to kind of reevaluate and reconsider that idea because, you know, it's almost too easy or too convenient to say, it's a very simple position to take. Like anybody trying to make any money whatsoever is always, you know, it's, it's selling out. It's stealing yeah, from the community simplistic. in a way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And what I'm realizing is that when I allow people who want to support me and there are people who see what I'm doing and they're thinking, oh, you should do more of this. I'm like, oh, I can only do that on the weekend because I got a job. And then people are like, oh, you know, you should, you should do more of this so that, you know, more people can benefit. And then I realized that, oh, my aversion to asking people for money or to like, you know, like putting up a Patreon and letting people pay me. I, I like procrastinated for over a year on starting a yeah. Patreon because I'm like, I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm doing this stuff, but I don't want to make it about me. I don't want to make it about money, you know, but then it came to the point where I realized that, oh, I could be doing meetups around the world. I'm, I'm doing New York next month, I don't know, in April. And, you know, I could also, you know, if I had more money, I could do London, you can do more. Berlin. Yeah. And what, what really messed me up in the best way was realizing my fear of being seen as extractive, my personal ego, my personal self-concept, that's the bottleneck, that's the roadblock between me and 
more events, like more opportunities for people to do more. Right. And like, so it's like, like it's my fault. It's my fault that, because people want to give me money and I'm like, nah, let's not do that. When it could be, you know, it's not about me. It's like, they, I'm, I'm kind of like the middle man in the process. You're and the like, if they, give me the mon- if they give me the money, I can use that to invest in more people and, and expand the pie for everybody to enjoy. And so I'm still in this process of trying to unlearn some of the conditioning that, oh, any, any, any mention of money makes the process dirty. Like, it's not true. It allows me to, it's, yeah. it's, it's trust. People are trusting me to, you know, take That's their right. money and right, get a better That's microphone, right. get a better camera. That's right. Now, yeah. I'll, I'll say, I want to say two things about that. The first is there's two papers that I, I want to send you both of them. I don't know if you've read them, but uh, they're both academic papers. One's called um, Sense of Community. It's a definition of what community is. It's by two, I think, gentlemen, Macmillan and Chavez, written in 86. I'm going to send that because uh, it's super, super, super powerful. Uh, and I think cool. that it's true both of in-person communities, which is obviously what they studied, um, as well as the behaviors that I observe in digital communities. And it has nice. to, one of the things that's super interesting, um, so I'll, I'll actually talk about the second paper. The second paper is called The, U- the Ultra Social Animal, and it's like a meta study of um, kind of humans versus our closest relative, great apes, who are also, nice. very, uh, I think it's gorillas or something. I, I don't know, I don't know which, which yeah. ape. Um, Bonobos? Something, something like that. <laughs> and the ways in which humans are social are totally different. Um, yeah. We have like a bird's eye view understanding of humans. And we can kind of like as a group, like you can almost everybody can visualize a group of people mm-hmm. kind of from the top yeah. down and how we're one in that thing. We also have yeah. some meta understanding of the group as like a human. Um, but one of the things that's true that comes across in both papers is that we don't like freeloaders. We don't yeah, like yeah, people who yes. are not pulling their weight. And when we feel yeah. that we care about something, we like to contribute to it positively. In other yes. words, it is like right. it is very much like denying someone an opportunity to show how much they care and to help to like not accept right. to not accept you know their help. And one yeah. of the things that I think about a lot, and maybe this is something for you to consider, is that people like me who's trying to do something for melee, but also people like you, you're trying to grow this kind of community can accept mm-hmm. money, but you can also accept people's time and people's talent if you can right. find ways to have them be put. Yeah. In. And I think that it's equally rewarding to provide money yeah. as to provide yeah. like services. So that's yeah. the first thing. The second thing is that I, I have the same feeling of anything that even smells like me doing something to increase my kind of standing is yeah. like taboo. Like I'll, I'll never right. do it. I'd rather die. Yeah. Yeah. I found a way to keep that to be, and I don't know if this is healthy, but I found a way to keep that true and then to kind of serve the game and have that be the thing that I do and kind of continue to stigmatize the idea of like me accepting a bunch of money from people and then taking a percentage of it for myself that's Mm -hmm. not earned. You know, I want to take the bare minimum to allow me to make the optimum use of the money that's there. Um, So I don't know. I think that's good. I think it's good that you feel that way and it probably means that you can't get too far the other way. But right. like yes. people yeah. can smell it on you that you don't like to do that. And that's yeah. why they trust you. I think like yeah. I trust yeah. you because I, I don't know. I feel yeah. like you would never take my money and then not do something that's like pro social. Yeah. I just yeah. don't think you would. Yeah. That's and why you're the guy like, who I want to have the money. Right. And for me, it's like, um, you know, it's not even, so for some people it might be some kind of a struggle, but for me, it's, it's just obvious that, like if I spent the money, like, you know, if I, if I collected money for something and then I spent it on some dumb shit, like, you know, my, like my personal, whatever, Whatever, like that is, you know, that's, that's me disrespecting the process. And when I disrespect, right. And when I disrespect the process, like I fucked up the good thing and I want the good thing. Like I'm here because, right. It's like, that's your whole purpose. Yeah. So it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's almost like like my, my brain is serving me like religious imagery. Like imagine if you started a church, started some kind of religious institution and then people give you money and then you just literally go and I don't know, do something terrible with it. Like it's just, it's not, a, not even a trade-off for me. It's like, why would you, you know, so when I, when I hear about, um, you know, so I have friends who are kind of working in the media or working in, you know, people who, I, I know of people who like um, started out do, as content producers like making comedy videos or whatever. And then there comes, there comes a point along the way where, you know, they feel like they've put in the work. They feel like they've, 
they've paid their dues and they have and then they decide to kind of um, you know so what some people might criticize as selling out they kind of decide, and the thing is they don't do it in an unethical way they just kind of decide that okay I have enough of an audience I can monetize the audience and uh, I'm happy with this like I'm not I've done my work I'm done like I'm not gonna you know there's enough momentum at this point that I can do sponsored content and I can do, you know, that kind of thing. And I, I have a couple of close friends even doing that kind of thing. And I, I still love them and they know that, you know, but like my, my, if they wanted my criticism, my criticism wouldn't, it wouldn't be that you're a bad person. My criticism is, I wish you were more ambitious. You know, I wish you had a bigger dream that, you know, that you're not done. You're not, you did. You weren't put on this earth to kind of become like sell lipstick and and. I mean, it's fine. You can do that. Like, so if you're getting your meaning in your life from like you know your family or something else that you're doing, like that's fine. Like, I know I'm not judging anybody who does that. If, as long as you're not kind of conning people and lying to people. Right. Like, if you're honest about what you're doing and you choose to be like, oh, you know, I have a makeup line. You can buy my makeup and and you know I'm I'm. Like, that's fine. Like I don't judge that. But you could be you could be a you could be so much more. Like you could. You could continue down that process and and you know kind of serve something much much greater. And it, you know, I'm kind of in the early middle stage of my own journey, so maybe it's easy for me to say these things. And I I don't have kids yet, but you know, my wife and I are both kind of in the same mindset about like we think it's better for our kids to have parents who have values and are like really serving something they really believe in. Yeah. Then like oh you know we can buy you some nicer toys, but you know, we 100%. don't really love what we're doing. A hundred percent. I was a, I was a child of, you know, uh, who had, who got everything that he wanted, but never learned what I cared about, you know, what I really wanted, yeah. what yeah. motivated me. Yeah. I think that that's the hardest problem. That's the hardest question though, for, for those people is like, what is it that you care about so much? I think it's yeah. so sad how hard it is for people to find something that really inspires them, kind of lights yeah. them up from the inside. Right. How do you find that? And once you do, the other thing that I think is very sad is that it's difficult to understand how you contribute. Right. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I joke sometimes that I, was, I must have been radicalized by books and by art. Because, you know, again, my life is my life. So from the inside, everything about my life just seems like obvious and normal. But again, now that I'm in my, like, I'm my late 20s, early 30s, I talk to friends to whom, like, so like I mentioned earlier, like my lawyer and investment banker friends who are kind of unhappy. And then so I try to have conversations with them and they, like we said, they, they don't know what they like. And to me, it's like, then what were you doing? I guess they were studying really hard and doing their homework and, and hoping that it will all make sense later in life. But for me, when I was like even 15 and 16, I would go, to, I would be depressed when I was at that age and I like go into school and I'm like, none of this makes sense. Like, what is this all about? Like, mm -hmm. you know, like when I was when I was a child, I was reading about about civilizations and galaxies and like all these grand exciting things. And now here I am learning like the op, like some you know some obscure math like which you can always learn at any time in your life, right? If you really want to. But like, what's the point? Like you're you're going through these standardized tests and stuff, and it's it's just it. I always wanted to. I, I guess I just I, I caught a whiff of it from authors and musicians. Like you, you read a book yeah. by an author who really, who really freaking loves literature or whatever, and they really, they really painfully. You can, you can read it off the page. Like you can feel the vibe. Like the person who wrote this, they really wanted you to feel their excitement or their anger or whatever. And once you catch that, like oh shit, that you can live life like that. It's like a glorious adventure. And I guess if you've never tasted that before, then you know like somebody says, oh, you should be an investment banker. You'll make lots of money. But like, oh yeah, okay. Because you don't realize that there is that call of the wild adventure that life could be. And so, you know, yeah, I try to, I try to keep that in mind. I try to share that with people so that, yeah, it's just life can be fun. You know, it should be fun. It shouldn't be. We aren't here to accumulate resources, right? We're here to use the resources that we have to do interesting shit. Like, you know, yeah, you get it. I get it. I don't know how to, I don't know how to spread that. I, I have, I feel that something happens like you got radicalized you say right but you I, you know as you probably think now and as i think you know you kind of had your eyes open where to me it seems yeah. like the game of making money and getting societal acceptance which by the way is bullshit right people have a bunch of money they don't feel yeah. truly accepted or held by society yeah. society holds no one i i know about right. no one yeah i but know we're all chasing i that. know 
Mm-hmm. And and yeah. I guess yeah, I have, the, one, the thing I want I'm aware. Thing, yeah, yeah. Just the, the the point there is that I feel like like that is something that kind of we a lot we we like grow a gen we've grown a generation of people who believe that there's meaning in that, but there isn't. Like it's a, the society is just a process yeah. that does not care and is not human. And so like we're yeah. kind of assuming that that's the game worth playing, and only the people who have won that game understand that there's nothing at the end of it. And then right, yeah. you've got a bunch of people who don't have the thing that they care about, but who are progressing in a thing that they don't care yeah. about, but they don't yet realize that right. they don't care about it. Yeah, You're right. The kind of sick thing when you think about it, so there's like this Jim Carrey quote that's like, uh, I, I wish everybody could get rich and famous and successful so you could see that it's not what you want. And uh, I think Russell Brand has a similar quote. And just, yeah, if you go looking for it, you realize that there are a lot of people who are very wealthy who are not happy at all. And um, it's kind of perverse when you think about it because the the economic machine or like the main, like just uh, however you want to frame it, it's it's run by people. It's like this this chronic anxiety machine where, you know, even though consumerism doesn't satisfy people, it's it you know it pushes the needle on the short term for you know whatever people who are marketing executives who don't really believe in what they're doing but they have no choice because they have a mortgage and student loans and so they have to pay it off and so they they come up with advertising to tell other people that and then it's just this this cycle of of misery in a way and um, yeah I mean anyway you said we're not sure how to spread it I I, I think so just as like you know like what you are doing with your melee community I feel like um there are thousands of people, maybe hundreds of thousands of people who are doing, who are each in their own way doing this sort of thing. Yeah. And I think we kind of, what, what, one of my goals is to connect as many people like that to each other. And just, you know, like, um, again, it, uh, it wouldn't be like an explicit community so that, you know, you have like, then you have to care about two communities. Like, oh my God, like, you know, it's a, it's a kind of loose so I, I think that I joke about sometimes, which is actually completely true when I talk to people on Twitter and they're like, oh, you know, um, I wish there were other people like us. And I'm like, I'm going to find all of them so that yeah. you can find each other through me, you know, so that you don't, you don't need to do all. So like, if everybody had to do all the work that I do to get fulfillment and belonging in, in life, we're all fucked. Yeah, we're all <laughs> fucked. No, 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 I totally agree. Is, I totally agree. But, but the amazing thing is, like once I do it, I can like bring a thread with me. Yes. And then, like, we have a path. Yes, network right? effects, yeah. right? That like economists talk about this, but when it comes to money all the time, it's comparative advantage, yeah. man. Why should everyone yeah. have to, because the, the, the alternative is everyone has to reinvent every wheel, which I feel is yeah. actually kind of what people are asked to do when they try to grow their own career. Yes. Like, you get good at everything. Yes. No, why can't I just be yeah. on a team? It, well, I'm really yeah. good at one thing that's really important right. and somebody else is really good at another thing that's yeah. really important. And we just work and you together. Know, you, know what's ama- right. you know what's amazing? This is, this is the message in so much art. You know, even in like the Avengers or Teen Titans or, or true, yeah. the, just so many stories is, um, you know, like I have a thread on Twitter that's like, we feel like we have to be happy all the time or, or you know, whatever. We have to be competent all the time or effective all the time. But, you know, we, we don't. We can, take care, we can take turns. Like, I can have a bad day. Like, in, if you're married, like, you know, whichever spouse is more put together that day, they can lead making decisions and whatnot. And, like, we can, this extends all the way. Like, if we have a community, like, If you can work on that having, for, before having a kid, that will be really powerful when you do have a kid. Yeah, I'm actually thinking yeah, about creating that rule now. Uh, you know, my yeah, son's right. Thing. Where it's like whichever right. one of us is more like calm and collected, you, like that right. person's in charge. Yeah, that's actually how. So I, when I was in the military, I was uh, like support staff to like a commando parachuting unit, and that's how they do it. And it's, it's like super competent, super high functioning guys, and they don't care about their rank or whatever. It's just anybody who feels like, hey, like this yeah. is like we can, like whoever wants to step up, everyone else respects that that guy feels that he has the best um, and it's because you know they're doing life and death shit like it's not they yeah. don't care about status when they're going to be jumping out of planes they're like right. if anybody feels that something is off like everyone listens to that guy so there is there is some um, there is something about the camaraderie of people in kind of extreme environments I, I also saw this with like um, scuba diving instructors in, in Thailand like they have that same kind of this very relaxed competence and trust in each other because they know that they need to depend on each other and that's not, yeah, that's super cool to witness and I, I think about it a lot. But yeah, like, you know, so we just need to kind of help people see that they can lean on each other 
which is yeah. uh, like the amount of excess capacity that frees up for everybody is insane. Like insane. Then we can like, yeah. So once people, that's so when the game one of the ways begins. I frame these things is. That's yes, when the game yes, begins. yes. Oh my God. Find so the much. others, take stock right. of our strengths and weaknesses. Mm-hmm. That's when we can get yeah. to work and, you know, build whatever culture and society and whatever we want to on the back of it. Hey, real, real quick. So yeah. it's nine forty right now. I got, I got to run because I'm. I, do you know about a healthy hmm. gamer? You heard about them? No. So there's a first time I'm hearing about a it. gentleman named Alok Kanoja. He was addicted to video games as a younger yeah. person and ended up going to India to study in an ashram as a, like one of many measures to like help him re- release his addiction. Um, mm-hmm. And while he was there, he like realized that he wanted to become a monk. He like got super spiritual. And the monks told him, okay, you can become a monk, but first you have to kind of finish your worldly duties and kind of get your degrees. Like he was going to be a doctor. And so he needed to do that first. So while he was going to go do that, hmm. uh, he met a woman who ended up becoming his wife. She's super cool. She's working with him now. They're working together on this thing called Healthy Gamer. Um, nice. And so long story short, you've got this guy who was a gamer, was addicted, got super spiritual to the point where he you know, could have become a monk and is a psychiatrist. And he's actually using twitch to talk to gamers about mental health um and about how to live your life it's a lot of the stuff that i think we both naturally care about um yeah and uh their channel is super blowing up i totally think that live streaming is going to be uh you know a a a set of tools and services for people like you and like him and like me yeah uh super effective at bringing a bunch of people together and kind of doing that thing where you both talk about the game, whatever it is, but also help yeah. other people like figure out what the rules are and like create norms, which are so crucial to help us treat nice. each other well. So anyway, um, I'm going to be uh, a guest on his show in like 20 minutes. I'm a little bit nervous, nice. to be honest, but uh, ah. yeah, I could send you the link if you, if you want to check some of it out, but he's super cool. And awesome. all his content is really, really, really good. Um, That's cool. Yeah. I will look him up. Yeah, I think awesome. that I think you would super dig it. My pinned tweet is one of his videos where he's talking to gamers about like how we think a lot, we do we do too little, and we need to start just right. doing stuff, even if it's bad. Just to go do something. Yeah, nice, awesome, dude. But I really yeah. enjoyed this conversation. I'd love to talk to you. Yes, again. I would love to. This was, mm-hmm. Yeah, this is super helpful for me. Actually, it's helping me too. Clarify. I have I should go and like sit down and and think about this and see what my like this stuff I think I'm, I'm gonna rewatch this I'm pretty sure like just totally to yeah and you know what you know what I would love to do if we do talk again I, I, I'm not gonna say if let's let, let's schedule yeah. a follow-up and talk again because I would sure. love to ask you how you think about Twitter as a medium and kind of share with you how I think about live as a medium I think that awesome. I'm quite good at thinking about the viewers and kind of uh I'm a good host for right. you know, live discussion or podcast mm-hmm. I right. don't I suck at tweeting I'm actually (laughs) garbage at tweeting. Right. I have so many thoughts that I think are interesting that I don't tweet. Like so, so, so many. Like I get lazy in the middle or I like, you know what I mean? I just, Eh. I don't, I haven't found my, I haven't, here's the best way to put it. I haven't found my voice on Twitter. Right. I feel that I've found my voice, uh, especially if I'm a host. That's cool. That's cool. I, I, I think you will, it shouldn't be difficult for you to, it's like micro adjustments basically. That would be, I would think it's, I would find it very, very rich and, 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 you know, interesting. And I think that a lot of people would do a lot of people would love to nice. hear your thoughts on it. Awesome. All right. So for this, will you send me the recording or how do we do it over email? Awesome. Yeah. It'll awesome. be the same format as the one that I sent where I talked to Malcolm. Uh, Sweet. I'd send you the, did, did you ever, do you know if you yeah, I watched that? This. Did that format work? I think so. I think so. Okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. So yeah, I'll All do right, dude. and we'll talk over DM. Yes, let's do that. It was so nice to finally talk to you in this in yes. this way. It was great. I enjoyed it very much. All right. Catch you later, <laughs> See ya. All right. Sweet.